Good afternoon and welcome back. Um, I hope our next segment um, will excite you as much as it excites us. Um, it's humbling to be introducing our keynote speaker, Ketrin Yusuf, whose work has been extremely influential in the process of plotting for our exhibition, Hollow Earth, but also our uh, research strand, Emergency and Emergence. <laughs> Catherine today will be lecturing on rethinking geologic subjectivity in broken earths and will expand on what it means to be a geologic subject in the Anthropocene and when and where are the broken earths of the planetary. Whilst thinking through the undergrounds as a potential sphere that disrupts the plasticity of the surface, destabilizing the politics of the present, Catherine will time travel in the broken earths of the Anthropocene to unearth the historical constructions of racialized undergrounds of the indigenous black and brown life. Considering undergrounds as archetypes in the production of knowledge and the materializing of colonial worlds, Yusuf will look to the mine and the cave to discuss accounts of materiality and geologic time. Understanding undergrounds as an act effective medium of colonial earth, she will address questions of inhuman intimacy and subterranean tactics to redress the weaponization of geology. Our invitation to Catherine Yusuf uh, comes from a long lasting inspiration from her work. This is not the first time um, Catherine's research infused our program and modern operandi. In 2015, with Humanity on the Rocks, the Anthropocene panel, uh, and over the course of 2020, through our prominent collaboration with the Tree Ecologies Research Group, uh, manifested in the format of Slow Reading Group, our audiences focused on Catherine's A Billion Black Anthropocenes or None, which was led by our dear moderator, Andrew Guffey. I'm also extremely grateful for the deep and careful collaboration Andrew has provided over the years uh, from various different projects in the formats of symposia, gatherings, discussions, and in conversations. Our collaboration with Tree Ecologies Research Group has been evolving, shape-shifting, and developing mainly thanks to him. We're also working on an exciting program together, um, more to be announced in, uh, hopefully in the new year, so please stay tuned for that. Uh, more, updates are, more updates are coming. Without further delay, I'm very excited to introduce our keynote speaker, Catherine Yusuf, uh, who is a professor of inhuman geography in the School of Geography at Queen Mary University of London. Her research examines how inhuman and non-organic materialities have consequences for how we understand issues of environmental change, race, and subjectivity. Most recently, she is the author of A Billion Black Anthropocenes or None, published by University of Minnesota Press in 2018, in which no geology is neutral, writes Catherine Yusuf. Rather than renaming and reclaiming the concept of Anthropocene, which exhibits fundamentally a colonial and racist geology, Yusuf offers a deliberately transformative vision, the non-event of a billion black Anthropocenes. Thus, against the reductive, universalizing, homogeneous Anthropocene, Yusuf suggests not one, but many Anthropocenes. By drawing on the work of Sadia Hartman, Edouard Glisson, Fred Morton, and sci-fi writers like N.K. Jemison, whose broken earth trilogy found this place in the title of today's presentation, Yusuf makes eliminating links between critical race studies and the environmental humanities. Yusuf is also the author of the Theory, Culture, and Society special issue with Nigel Clark, titled Geosocial Formations and the Anthropocene, which looked into the relationship between geological and social transformation and the context in which social relations emerge and geologicals, geologicals effect on the social as a way of enabling and organizing social relations. Additionally, she is the author of Apocalypse Aesthetics, The Mind in Efflux, and in the Humanities in the Annals of American Geographers. Her forthcoming book, Geologic Life in Human Intimacies and the Geophysics of the Race, addresses the racial geologies of rocks. She is a recipient of the Association of American Geographers 2022 Award for Creativity in Geography. I'm also delighted to further introduce our moderator, Andrew Goffrey, who works at the University of Nottingham, where he is the director of the Center for Critical Theory. He is the editor of Gautery Effect, which Eric Allier and of the Allure of Things with Roland Faber. He is the co-author of Evil Media with Matthew Fuller. He has translated and edited, edited books by Isabel Stangers, amongst others, and is currently completing projects on the micropolitics of software and on the ecological thinking of Felix Guattari. A quick note for those who are joining us for the first time. 
Uh, there will be a Q&A section at the end of the conversation between uh, Katrin Yusuf and Drew Coffey. For recording purposes, please wait for one of our event assistants to bring you over a microphone. Without further delay, the floor is, your, uh, floor is yours, dear Katrin. Thank you. So, um, what I wanted to talk to you about today was kind of also sort of represents a bit of a trajectory that I've had in terms of my work through thinking about this idea of geologic subjectivity and thinking about it particularly in this sort of moment of the Anthropocene, of, of climate change, of extinction events and so on. And thinking also about how those kind of futures and those often apocalyptic futures relate to the various extinctions and broken earth that were kind of made in uh, the process of making this Anthropocene Earth. So we might think about the Anthropocene as a kind of, as a sort of product of um, and um, uh, a, a set of colonial practices that broke many Earths um, from 1490. Um, to right through to the present and continues to break earths of people's life worlds uh, and often black and brown subjects, racialized subjects, poor subjects that are caught in the kind of crossfire of geologic extraction. And the reason that kind of I put race and geology together was when I first started trying to write a history of geology, um, and I start, first started looking at the kind of histories of geology within um, colonial uh, worlds, um, I found at the same time that paleontologists who were kind of giving advice on, um, on kind of geologic formations, on rivers, on silt, on kind of various forms of kind of pl plantation farming and mining um, were also producing discourses about race. So this kind of question of shaping the earth and kind of geo-forming the earth was also kind of concurrent with this kind of terrorization of the earth through the, subject, uh, uh, the subjugation of racial formations. Um, so I always uh, think race and geology alongside each other as kind of coming into the world at the same moment. And they come into the world through these kind of conjoined discourses. So this question of deep time, for me, always oscillates around a question of timing the subject and how certain subjects are deep time. So how certain subjects are produced as kind of fossilized or produced as backward in time. And we think about all these kind of discourses of progress um, and now in kind of development narratives um, around kind of uh, the development of resources um, and this idea of some kind of um, the natural resources are the basis of an advancement in time. Um, and how that's configured into understandings of human origins. Um, so that's kind of where I, where I kind of ended up. But I started very much uh, in a kind of, in these kind of questions of geologic subjectivity within the caves, actually. It was work I did um, some time ago. And thinking about the sort of interrelation between non-human and inhuman forces in kind of this art of narrativizing the human subject. Um, and what's interesting about these kind of caves and also the, the ways in which the kind of, the work in these caves uh, described is that often by kind of um, anthropologists, human, origis, human origin uh, theorists, is always narrative, uh, narrativized around the kind of the human mark. Um, but then, you know, when you actually go into the caves, and these are from Lascaux, very quickly you realize that the cave is participating in this making. And the okra of the rock, the um, images are made by spitting, they're made by kind of uh, a mixture between kind of ground animal bones and spit and so on. So, all at once, this is also a kind of multi-species kind of production, uh, and it's a relationship with the kind of inhuman. Um, and they were also kind of painted in the dark. Um, so we heard earlier about kind of bringing light to those spaces. They were painted with the light of animal fat 
and lines drawn uh, on caves with um, with kind of animal paint. So there's this kind of there's this question here about kind of how the geologic subject kind of comes into being, um, and often the kind of cave gets removed in that narrative. It becomes about a narrative of human origins, human cre creativity, and somehow the kind of the inhuman and non-human get kind of segued out. Um, so that's really kind of where I started thinking about geology and really thinking about these kind of geomorphic aesthetics as a kind of space of engagement with an environmental epistemology. So a lot of these kind of caves, the paintings were done sort of, to, you know, in cave spaces that emerge at the last glacial maxim. And I was kind of thinking then about climate change and thinking about what the kind of, you know, what what kind of human sociality looked like um, at the kind of end of the last kind of climate epoch. Um, and I began thinking with the caves as kind of spatialities that actually drew kind of the images into being as much as kind of um, thinking with the kind of figure of the drawer. Um, and particularly because these caves, um, the caves of Lascaux, were found at the very moment uh, where surface, the surface was under destruction in World War II. So the, um, the French theorist Georges Bataille, he talks about you can't think about the concentration camps without Lascaux, and consequently you can't think about Lascaux without the concentration camps. So, Immediately, for me, they set up this kind of imagination of the sort of discourse between what's underground and what's on the surface, and that relationship often between kind of violence and kind of creativity um, and things that are made for a time that may not arrive. So things that are made in in the kind of in uh, uh, in a kind of valuing of uh, kind of engagement that is not necessarily about the surface and surface conditions. Um, so I was kind of thinking about around these ideas about what does the kind of rock touch into being in kind of in human, uh, in an engagement within human that we've kind of very much, has very much fallen out of our kind of discourses um, at the moment where you have kind of the separation between the inhuman, the non-human, and the human. And that kind of is through these discourses uh, and narratives of geologic time that are made by paleontologists um, right at the kind of moment of uh, colonialization. But also this kind of, there's something very, um, I think, compelling about the idea of what geology allows in terms of survival for the future. So things, marks that are made for a future that is yet to arrive. And to think about this as a kind of, almost like a speculative fabulation, to use Donna Haraway's term, or a kind of critical fabulation, to use Sadia Hartman's term, a way of kind of thinking into a future that is yet to arrive. So a kind of, um, and there's lots of other underground spaces that came in to kind of, to use the underground as a way to kind of challenge surface conditions. But also these kind of diagramming of passages across entities to think about a much more kind of mixed ecological in, uh, he heritage across inhuman timescales. It's one thing if the in inhuman gives us is it kind of gives us um, kind of a, a different temporal frame, a different kind of way to come at um, our kind of present conditions. So it's interesting the kind of origin stories that were being told about um, kind of caves um, and how origin stories were used to kind of shape uh, often ending stories. So in terms of the, uh, the context of the Anthropocene, these kind of, you know, apocaly often apocalyptic or utopic kind of um, endings. So there's something interesting around what is hidden in these kind of um, in uh, in these kind of images, um, which you know it, the kind of creating a sort of absent hand, an absent body, and you can see that there's this kind of all these forms of if those of you that have sort of been in any of these caves in southwest France or northern Spain, that there's a lot of kind of 
cross-fertilization between bodies. Um, and there's, only, there's very, very few human bodies. It's a kind of riot of animality, and not animality in the way it's sort of narrated as hunting, kind of like, it's actually like deers licking other deers, and all sorts of kind of intimacies between kind of animality, of which, you know, the human is part of. Um, and the other kind of set of cave paintings I was looking at were these kind of uh, paintings up in the Guanguam of Western Australia, the sort of north uh, caves in uh, um, Western Australia. And they're the, these kind of swimming, dreaming, moving, um, kind of s humanoid creatures. Um, but they're actually made and held together as an image um, through um, bacteria and so there's another f life form and they they resist each other and they're different colors so they keep growing so this kind of these paintings are made with li living pigments that are constantly sort of regenerating at the speed of kind of bacteria uh, and other molecules so this kind of image of of kind of of human animal um, Worlding is being carried forward by a kind of set of molecules. So it kind of, you know, when we begin to think about the ground of the image and the kind of who, like what aesthetics is, um, and it, it gives us a very kind of provocative image of how we are carried forward by the world and how we're made through these kind of different uh, incorporations and kind of collectives of ecological life. So that's kind of where I started with caves. Um, but where I kind of ended up very quickly uh, was this kind of with this question of colonial earth. And colonial earth and it's kind of others particularly. So if, if the Anthropocene is the outcome of colonial earth, there's lots of other black, brown, indigenous earths that were broken on the way to that kind of production and that kind of universalizing language of natural resources that now kind of organize um, our, our kind of uh, colonial afterlife. Um, and to really kind of take seriously the forms of inhuman tactics um, that were made within the kind of the space of that oppression and the space of that transformation of Earth. And as um, I always thinking alongside N.K. Jemison, and particularly when I was writing Black Anthropocene, someone gave this to me and said, you must read this. <laughs> and I was just like, wow, this is like kind of, um, and, if those of you that have read Broken Earth Trilogy, it's a really fantastic uh, trilogy. Um, it's all about um, these um, group of uh, people, origins, who are enslaved, uh, and they can also uh, modify and kind of change geology. So they kind of cess the earth and they have these kind of, they have these abilities to actually um, both kind of shape geology, but also break it. But they're used by the kind of uh, enslaving enslavers to basically protect them. So they, they're used as a kind of buffer to uh, regulate geologic shocks. And what happens through the course of this novel is that they actually start to break the earth. Uh, and this is kind of, and an N.K. Jemison's sort of uh, take on this is really the kind of, because people couldn't share. Because these worlds, as she says, were b built on a fault line of pain, held up by nightmares. So, like, so rather than thinking about the kind of uh, lamenting the end of our particular world, that actually we should be thinking uh, about why those worlds have existed for so long. And particularly in terms of the Anthropocene, thinking about why have these kind of colonial uh, uh, kind of homogenizing forces uh, around the kind of narrative of what the world is, why have they been sustained and why have they kind of been uh, continually sustained uh, for so long, given the kind of uh, the forms of subjugation that they're built on. So she says, I wrote the Broken Earth Trilogy to speak to that struggle and what it takes to live, let alone thrive, in a world that seems determined to break you. So she's, this, this kind of motif of breaking Earth um, goes through the novel. And it's kind of alongside uh, work that I've been thinking about, about kind of 
what are the infrastructures of Earth that remains? And there's this on the that side is uh, sort of uh, Cecil Rhodes's head that's kind of been knocked off. But it's like once we get rid of the kind of colonial, um, you know, sort of. Uh, uh, kind of figureheads in space, we're still left with the mine. So the infrastructures still remain and still remain kind of violently um, kind of oppressive um, to um, very particular racialized groups of people. Um, so this kind of, uh, this kind of came to, uh, to uh, inform my um, empirical work was really thinking about the mine as a, as a kind of paradigmatic as a kind of, you know, a human-made cave in a sense, and to think about the underground as a racial repository. And I was looking at this in Alabama through convict lease labor. So convict lease labor was basically enforced carceral labor uh, after emancipation. And it became another way in which you could, um, through the black codes, actually kind of kidnap young black men and boys. Uh, and they built these prisons at the entrance to these mines uh, here in Alabama. And the mines in Alabama were uh, producing the materials for steel, and steel became the first billion dollar floated company in the US. Uh, and we're kind of part of the transformation of building the overground. So I became really interested in just the what it takes to build an overground. So often with architecture, we just look at the, the, the building, the architecture, the object, but actually what every architecture relies on often uh, and on a racialized underground. And we can think about undergrounds, overgrounds in terms of, you know, dark kitchens, you know, uh, fishing boats off Malaysia, plantations. Um, so there's, you know, we can begin to think about these kind of ways in which the underground is also kind of uh, in the overground. Um, but in this particular case in Alabama, and Alabama became the richest uh, state in the country of leasing um, prisoners to corporations. So it really institutionalized what we now call the kind of um, uh, the prison complex in the US. Um, but it was built on these kind of underground um, prisons. And I was also thinking about kind of the, the, the narratives around um, kind of uh, white undergrounds too, and they're kind of increasing emergence within kind of, uh, I guess, various kind of doomsday uh, scenarios and prepping, and we get lots of kind of tech boys building kind of underground prep shelters in sort of, you know, the south of New Zealand and so on. And this was a really popular book, um, Edward Buller Linton's Vril, and he was actually uh, the, the uh, in charge of um, uh, the um, colonial office at one point. So he wrote this as someone who was within the kind of state government organizing um, colonial affairs. And it's called Real, the Power of the Coming Race. And it's kind of, you can probably figure out what it's, who the coming race are. Um, I won't go into that now, but, and Real was the kind of power of, um, of this uh, race. So they have this energy source called kind of real. Um, and this very much kind of, in some ways, collides with the way in which I've been thinking about kind of geopower as kind of coming out of this white geology. The harnessing of geopower, the ability to use the value and energy of power through these through kind of keeping in place these racialized formations, whether we're talking about the mine, the plantation, or other kind of colonial formations of extraction. Uh, and this is just a I found this out from my colleague the other day, but uh, Vril also kind of became uh, the, the kind of the energy in Bovril, which was uh, very much uh, a substance designed uh, around cow parts to power the British Empire. So we can kind of see how these imaginaries start to kind of shift and move 
in these kind of um, colonial spaces, but they're already there. The underground and the overground are always across kind of the, across the kind of um, bifurcation of race, are always kind of talking to each other and in a kind of narrative uh, discourse. Uh, and this is kind of a view of Ghana, you know, and it's uh, this highly racialized kind of before colonialism and then this kind of Bovril after colonialism. Um, and all these kind of theories also connect to, um, as I, when I saw the show, it was called Hollow Earth. As a former polar kind of geographer, I was like, because um, Hollow Earth is very, um, very sort of active in polar imaginations um, through John Sims, um, but also because of the kind of all the sort of um, theories around. Um, the National Socialists and uh, Antarctica and going into Hollow Earth. So uh, there was lots of, and there still are, as I found out when I looked on the internet, uh, there still are lots of Hollow Earth kind of conspiracies going on. And I don't know, they, you can, they often involve these kind of like white Aryan kind of in some sort of magical uh, world um, where clearly the problems of race don't trouble uh, them anymore. Um, so I started to think about race as a geophysics. So not just as a kind of, you know, a metaphysics of coding people, uh, uh, you know, in sort of various kind of human, subhuman, inhuman, as was the kind of uh, organization of the human and uh, less than, with the apex being kind of uh, mm -hmm. white hetero patriarchy, but extraction itself is uh, a question of racial geophysics, a question of burdens, of body burdens, of weights, of gravities, um, and also in, in terms of kind of stratal uh, and stratigraphic positions in space. Um, and that really kind of helped me think about how overgrounds and undergrounds are in this dynamic re spatial relation. Uh, and sometimes that's happening on the surface of the Earth, sometimes it's happening underground. But there's this kind of dynamic uh, movement between uh, the cruel of value on the surface and these kind of undergrounds that sustain but are kind of uh, removed from accruing value. Um, so this is, this is one of my kind of, for some reason this image really sums it up for me in terms of like kind of uh, Anthropocene Earth. Um, but we can think about the accrual of stratal geopower as a kind of a, as a question of the outcome of colonialism. So the ability to transform the earth has also been the ability to step back from the earth, to actually protect yourself from the earth's forces, to protect yourself from certain kinds of intimacies with the earth that you don't get to have if you're, um, you know, a child kind of. Uh, extracting coal, for example. And a lot of writers, uh, uh, post-colonial writers, obviously picked up on the kind of the organization of, uh, uh, of kind of humanism with its kind of inhuman bedrock and really kind of began to think with this inhumanism is what I kind of call it, but began to think with the inhuman world as a mode of subjectivity. So if you think about kind of enslavement brought people into a category of subjectivity that designated them as inhuman property. And uh, uh, post-colonial thinkers, decolonial thinkers involved in kind of liberation movements had to find a way and a language uh, to exist within subjectivity that, didn't, that couldn't kind of draw on the sort of dynamics and coordinates of humanist uh, literature or humanist kind of uh, thought. And as with Fanon in The Wretched of the Earth, but also Amy Césaire, uh, Edward, uh, Edouard Glisson, who's uh, actually his uh, supervisor was Bachelard, so Bachelard wrote The Poetics of Space, and Edward Glisson wrote The Poetics of Relation. And you can see there that kind of shift from a kind of space as a kind of 
a container or a kind of organizer, a spatial organizer to space as a relationally produced thing. And that's, uh, you know, I think kind of Glissant takes his supervisor's kind of uh, intellectual engagement and stretches it across the Caribbean in really interesting uh, ways. Um, but these thinkers were thinking against kind of whiteness as a geopower, not just in organizing subjectivity, but also organizing the very kind of conditions of life, the material conditions of life. Um, the, um, and we can see it sort of very clearly etched into the rock there, which is a, you know, a Native American sacred site, is the kind of the imprint of white patriarchy. So, a lot of, uh, as I said, the Caribbean writers particularly really engaged with the inhuman as a kind of site, uh, a provocative site of thinking with the kind of inhuman and that category rather than running away from it. So thinking further into the category of the inhuman and to rocks, uh, into the kind of this categorization of deadness to really kind of bring back um, what I think is a kind of... Uh, what we might think of, a, of as a different kind of material understanding of subjectivity. And it's a collective understanding of subjectivity, but it's collective not just with others, but it's collective with the earth and with the kind of, the, the tectonic kind of movement of the earth. So, uh, uh, Césaire, for example, talks a lot about the kind of the volcanoes under the Caribbean and, and the kind of and the connection between being like the connection of the kind of archipelagos of the islands. Um, and I wanted to. How am I doing for time? Okay, so I wanted to kind of end really on where my work has kind of ended up now, um, and really kind of just thinking about um, alongside um, some artists that um, I've been thinking with around kind of what, what, what kind of, how can we think about geologic subjectivities now in terms of a kind of reparative model to colonial earth? So what are the ways in which not to just describe how colonial earth comes into being, which, you know, um, I've been kind of very concerned about in terms of the kind of history of that, but also to start to, to think with what kind of new reparative kind of geologic models um, could look like. Um, and I've been really inspired, um, some of you might know their work, Cave Bureau, who are a Nairobi uh, group of architect architects directed by Stella uh, Mutakebi and Kabaj Karanj. And they uh, work with caves uh, as their kind of primary architectural form, and particularly the kind of caves of the Momo um, fighters who kind of, who, who occupied the caves during kind of uh, liberation movements. And they also, obviously that kind of, that iconography of the caves speaks to things like the kind of um, the Underground Railroad, and lots of histories of kind of fighters in caves, and kind of uh, caves as being spaces outside the state, and a space uh, f from which to challenge uh, the state. And they're really kind of, uh, they're also thinking with the Shimoni caves, which were a network of caves along the kind of East Africa that, uh, that supplied the East African slave trade. So, the, so enslaved people were kept in the, um, the Shimoni caves as they were moved along to the Eastern seaboard, which fed the kind of uh, slave trade to um, Arab and Middle Eastern countries. Um, so they're kind of working with these kind of spaces of trauma um, and spaces of kind of, uh, but also trying to think about how these spaces challenge and can be repurposed in a kind of revisioning of the kind of city. And they call this the more than human city of the future past. Um, so they use the kind of the Shimoni caves to kind of, and they use the shape of the, um, the architectural shape of the caves, and they sort of flip it up down to create this um, uh, cow, Maasai cow corridor through the city of Nairobi. And so the Maasai um, 
br often bring their cows into the city to graze, um, but there's lots of kind of problems, obviously, with cars and so on. And they created this whole kind of infrastructure through the city um, to create a Maasai cow corridor with salt licks, with veterinarians, um, to think about the kind of how the first inhabitants of the city, so the cows and their Maasai um, uh, keepers um, were, um, could be rethought into the kind of futurism, into the kind of African futurism as a kind of challenge to some of the more kind of um, uh, developmental projects uh, that are going on. And so they're thinking about how to narrate this kind of geography and space of the cave differently to transform its kind of, you know, its geotrauma as kind of spaces of subjugation, but also kind of to think with its kind of liberatory uh, possibilities. Um, so if we think about these kind of caves, uh, they think about them as kind of Anthropocene museums, um, but it makes me think about kind of Edward Glisson's um, call to generate museums of non-natural history. And he says, like, if, if, if colonial history is all about the kind of master subject man, the white European, then we need to develop these museums of non-natural history that talk to the kind of collective and sedimented histories, the ghosted histories, the erased and the kind of subjugated history that lay across um, the continent of Africa through the Middle Passage to the Caribbean and in the Americas and to start to develop languages to speak to the kind of all the histories, the billion black Anthropocenes, for example, that kind of um, have been uh, taken out of sight uh, when the... Um, the, the narrative of achievement is kind of colonial earth and the narrative of achievement is the kind of continual transformation of kind of, of geology um, towards a certain, kinds of, a certain kind of futurism. Uh, so I, maybe I'll leave it there um, with um, those ideas, but we might think that caves perhaps are a place to start, a place to think with in ways about how geology shape us uh, and, and to think with the kind of possibility and emergence of uh, challenging the surface through its underground spaces. So starting in the underground as a way to decolonize uh, the surface. Thank you. That's fantastic. Thanks ever so much, Catherine. Um, okay, we've got, we've got a bit of time now, so the idea was to have a sort of, um, for us to have a, com a kind of a conversation and then to throw the floor open to questions. Um, but I think actually, I mean, we'll, we'll kind of get a bit of a discussion going here, but if, if, if people wish to interrupt, um, they've got things to say before the formal Q&A, um, please, please put your hands up. There's, there, are, there is a microphone around, so um, don't wait if a question comes to mind um, whilst we're having a com the conversation, that's fine to um, fine to butt in. I think I'd, I'd be more comfortable like that anyway. Um, thank you ever so much, Catherine. That was a really interesting, really fascinating talk. It's raised all sorts of questions for me. Um, I wonder if I could just to, to start off a discussion. I'd, could you tell us a little bit more about your 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 practice as as a researcher? Because I was struck by the you know, your engagement with Cave Bureau at the end, mm -hmm. and I was thinking about how you work as a researcher, uh, building up um, this very impressive um, body of evidence about, uh, about race and geology. So I wonder if you could maybe just, I mean, I'm, I'm th really thinking mm -hmm. about just the concrete, concrete practice that you have yeah. as a researcher. I mean, one of the things that, uh, I've been thinking a lot about my own inheritance in a geography department and how I'm sort of situated by that in being in one of the most kind of imperial disciplines, but also kind of, um, and thinking about what that means for the kinds of geographies that we tell and kind of, um, and you know, within geography, there's been this really kind of huge sort of dominance of visual geography as a kind of, um, as the sort of, uh, narrative and representational scene, and much to kind of, you know, uh, overlooking 
all kinds of other ways of, of in which people kind of build a world or have an epistemology that kind of shapes. Um, so, I mean, I, th I think I kind of look outside of disciplines really for other ways of telling, narrating space, I think, and thinking about space and the politics of space, because, um, you know, you become very aware that you're, you're the sort of dialectics of space that you're involved with in the academy is incredibly limited. Um, so, kind of engaging with creative practice is one way to kind of think about um, other ways of sort of hearing space differently and thinking about kind of some of the sort of resident narratives of those spaces. Um, but also kind of just the, as a practice of deinstitutionalizing yourself. And I think as like academics, it's so easy to become, you know, maybe with practitioners as well, you become very institutionalized in your, in your worlds. And I always kind of am slightly trying to kick against that. Um, so uh, that's how my rogue geology comes into being. <laughs> that's a nice, it's a nice expression, rogue, rogue geology. Uh, it, I mean, it must make life a little bit difficult for you. It's quite, it's quite a challenging um, position for you to occupy. So I was wondering, um, <laughs> we talked a little bit about this before, before the talk started. I wondered how, uh, how your work had been received. If you'd like to say a little bit more about how your work has been received. I was thinking particularly with the issue with how your work was received by, um, firstly by other geographers, but mm. also by, by geologists as well, because it's, yeah, your work is... As, as articulates a strong position, which I imagine uh, um, that some people found a little bit difficult. Okay, yeah, I mm. mean, I think, like, weirdly, little, well, little, the little book, A Billion Black Scenes, just had a really interesting, diverse circulation. So, you know, I got emails from miners in South Africa, from nurses in the States, and, like, from a really kind of broad range of, and that was really incredible because I think it was like cheap and you could put it in your pocket and it sort of, um, it wasn't too much of an investment. Um, and that was really incredible. But w one of the sort of groups that really, I think, engaged with it were the kind of young um, artists working around kind of questions of race um, who got in touch with me and, you know, and then asked me to write things. And so the, the sort of next bit of work that follows this is really a kind of, is that discussion. Um, but yeah, it, 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 it sort of kicks against institutions, my work, and it's, um, it often has a much better interdisciplinary uh, reception than, uh, and the white supremacists really don't like it either. Um, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> it, um, but apart from that, it's, you know, I think geologists, I mean, we were talking about it earlier, that. Um, have found it confronting, but actually have kind of come around to kind of quite a, because they know their own disciplines are changing and they know, you know, that the, the question of race isn't, is, is endemic in kind of the geosciences um, from kind of, you know, um, our incredibly white geography and geology departments right through to kind of the impacts on, you know, it's, I don't think it's any wonder that you know, one of the highest kind of categories um, of targeted people are environmental defenders across the world. Um, and, you know, so, I, you know, there's, there's very clearly a politics there. And actually, I've, I've been surprised at how patient geologists have been with that work, which is, you know, kind of dense and a little bit unforgiving. <laughs> do, do you sometimes feel feel like maybe you, uh, you're fighting a bit of a losing battle. I'm, I'm struck by the, the the massive scale of production, just of something like geographical knowledge. Mm -hmm. So these sort of massive conferences that you have in the United States where you have thousands and thousands of people presenting and they're, they're from across the board, from the American military to, mm -hmm. you know, to, to goldsmith sociologists and things like that. It just feels like a... It feels like it, that in itself is a form of industrial production that's quite mm -hmm. difficult to, to 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 comprehend, let alone to to fight against. Does, does it does it feel like a losing battle sometimes? 
I think it, uh, what became, like, I was just, I, I've just finished a book that's taken me kind of 10 years, and it's a really big book because I wanted to tell, I wanted to, sh well, just show empirically through kind of lots of archival work and how, how big a complex it is, how, you know, you can look at kind of all these kind of, you can look at poetry, you can look at geologic kind of um, disciplines, you can look at extraction, and all these things form together in a kind of what I call the plateau. Um, but it's, it's actually kind of, it was really painstaking work putting that all together um, and trying to actually just show the kind of enormity of, like, but also the kind of discreteness of racial discourses within that. Um, so I think it is, I mean, like, you know, one of the reasons a lot of people like myself migrate into geography is that it's a bit of a pick and mix subject. You can kind of go and do what you want to do. And, um, you know, I think a lot of artists kind of go and do PhDs in geography because there's a, a certain amount of freedom to engage with material practices and engage with kind of like geographical ideas. But um, you can kind of go off and do, you know, if you don't mind kind of, you know, sort of working in your own <laughs> kind of, you know, it, along your own kind of lines. Um, yeah, so I think it's it, it's a challenge. I think the um, area of the geographic sciences that is in real kind of ascendance is extraction, and you know um, the questions of extraction are going to be you know they they are kind of end game end world questions. Um, so, but I kind of wanted to show where that started. I guess that was, I thought, well, okay, I can, I can do that. Um, we have N.K. Jemison for the endings. Well, I was, I was going to ask you a little mm -hmm. bit about, um, if you'd say a little bit more about science fiction. It's, it just struck me how ambiguous a resource science fiction might, might be in the sense mm -hmm. that on, on the one hand, uh, there's the, the amazing use made of science fiction, uh, by, mm -hmm. also by people like Octavia Butler, Mm -hmm. For example, but then on the other hand, you've got, you know, you you signalled the real narrative, mm -hmm. and then now, but nowadays I suppose people are talking about super intelligence instead of the coming ways. Could you say a little bit more about about how you see you know, the value of science fiction in uh, in the work that you do? Um, I mean, I think kind of you know, yeah, speculating is a you know is a very highly prized catalyst um, kind of you know uh, activity at the moment and kind of, you know, so I think, I never think about speculation as sort of in an innocent way, um, but it's also, you know, it's also an incredibly creative way of like showing what a world could look like and helping, you know, and, and I think that's what artists and musicians, they allow us to feel what a world might look like that we might want to get towards, right? Or kind of, you know, even, or disrupt uh, a kind of the skin of the world for long enough that we can just feel a different inhabitation. And so, you know, which I think kind of Lascaux in a weird way does in the middle of the Second World War, it sort of says, <laughs> like, there's this other, this other way of being in the world, right? Um, and, and so, you know, I think it's, it's an incredibly rich vein to uh, mine. Um, if, if we keep with the mining metaphors. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I think the, you know, tech companies are very interested in speculation too. Uh, they run a lot of the uh, sp speculative fiction competitions um, where they're getting people to, you know, sort of, um, Elizabeth Delofrey has done some work around this that where um, they're sponsoring, uh, and particularly black and brown queer artists, of course, because, you know, um, to write um, speculative fiction about renewables and particular kinds of renewables and so on. And so, um, yeah. Um, the ability to speculate and to dream is, is never innocent. No, <laughs> sure. um, but it can be a good political tool, I think. Well, you, you probably know more about that than I do. Mm -hmm. Well, I, was, I, was, I, I really like the quote that you that you, you put up on one of the slides, it was the Glissant quote about poetic knowledge. Poetic mm. knowledge is born in the great silence of scientific knowledge. 
So I, one of the things I was wondering a little bit about, um, I've engaged a lot with the work of Isabel Stengers, and, and Stengers has a very you know, complex uh, view on scientific knowledge, mm -hmm. and I'm wondering about that, um, the relationship between kind of poetic knowledges and science, and, and is, is there, in your view, is there a possibility for kinds of scientific knowledge that, um, you know, stop enacting the kinds of gestures of exclusion and hierarchization and destruction that have clearly been operative in, in the histories um, that, you've been, that you've been following? Um, or is it always um, poetics that is in the position of resisting? Um, I mean, I don't think they are opposed, and I think there's, you know, there's obviously a great poetry of the rocks, um, but often it sort of has a sort of presumed innocence around other things. So, you know, like Goethe was the director of mines, for example. Like, you know, um, there's um, Thoreau was going on camping trips with um, Agassiz, who was, you know, a kind of great racial pseudoscience kind of um, propagator. So, you know, I think a lot of these kind of uh, a lot of these kind of um, ways in which we try and separate out those productions of knowledge uh, kind of are often quite artificial. But I think kind of the, I mean, one of the things that I do think has become really normative is that language of natural resources, a particular kind of uh, language of, you know, um, languaging of kind of, of, earth as either valuable or poetic so it's in this dialectic so it's kind of either or and we you know consider it sort of both of those without each other when in fact they're kind of a continuous production um, so I think where the kind of decolonial work um, of and the kind of poetics of the Caribbean writers really intervene is to actually kind of restructure that dialectic and you know the, so the Fanon pretty much says, no dialectic, a cosmic yes. And it's like, okay, we're gonna think about the cosmic as a way to kind of intervene in this kind of bifurcation, which is also the bifurcation of the human and the inhuman, the human and the dehuman that sustains forms of dehumanization. Um, I wonder if maybe this is a, a moment to throw throw the uh, conversation open to the, to the audience. Um, do people have questions? You know, you were talking about inhuman intimacies and inhumanity. Mm -hmm. um, I just wondered if you could extrapolate on that a bit more. Obviously, we all know some people who are, are human, inhuman and act in inhuman ways. Is that what you meant? Um, sorry, could you just say that last bit again? that we know that... We all know people who are inhuman, inhuman and to do inhuman things. Mm -hmm. We all know that. We, know, we all know someone like that. Yeah, I mean, I, I, was, I was kind of looking in, at the proximities between the inhuman as a kind of geologic category and the inhumane. And, um, you know, we can think about this in kind of contemporary terms of how environments are weaponized. So, you know, the desert between the Mexican kind of American border, the Mediterranean, the kind of, you know, you can think about kind of contemporary geographies of weaponization where, you know, kind of inhumane acts are kind of uh, uh, reliant on inhuman environments. Um, and there's this kind of proximity and intimacy um, that's created around certain kind of racialized bodies in that space. So, you know, there's very particular people um, being let drown in the Mediterranean, for example, on, and in, you know, on the small boats um, coming to the British coast. Um, so, but I was interested that also as a kind of historical category, so how it, under kind of the industrial slave production that people were literally categorized as inhuman property and designated within that inhuman category. Um, and 
at the same time that sort of geologists are off in America uh, and lots of other places around the world describing the kind of inhuman environment, they're also describing um, and racializing people through this inhuman category. Um, so those two things are happening together and they're being done by the same people. So they're kind of, um, you know, the same people that are mapping rock formations are also collecting skulls. So there's this kind of very, there's this very tight um, bonds between the inhuman and the inhumane. Um, but there's also th something that happens in that kind of, uh, within um, that categorization of, um, that actually kind of leads to the development of sort of inhuman tactics, we might want to call them, uh, forms of resistance to that subjugation. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thanks. Hi, thank you. Hi. Um, it was really interesting. Could you say a little bit more about when you mentioned ecological endings um, and how they link to the origin stories with a particular view on the subterranean world, maybe? Anything around that? Um, yeah, I mean, we could see, but like, you know, you could think about the Anthropocene, for example, as a consequence of taking a shed load of things that were, strat you know, stratified underground and putting them on the surface. And then on the surface, a different set of relationships happen, um, you know, because geology also has, it's, is kind of attracted to, you know, kind of the geochemical attraction um, once you start kind of burning fossil fuels, for example. So, um, I think, you know, we've tended to think about a kind of, in some ways, the surface of the earth uh, and less about the kind of the dimensionalities and the kind of what it means to take a whole load of kind of, you know, past geologic eras and kind of bring them up into the sunshine. Um, so that's, that's kind of, um, you know, it's not necessarily an ending as so much as a kind of transformation, but it, it does, you know, it does have a lot of uh, violence sort of uh, uh, secreted in it. And, you know, that's often very differentiated violence in terms of where those impacts lie and kind of how they impact. Um, so that's, that's one kind of ending. But I mean, I think we're kind of, you know, in terms of extinction. I mean, it's kind of interesting because like, the animal, the, some of the longest surviving animals are animals that can burrow underground. So things like the echidna, for example, that like, you know, if it's like a fire, you can go and kind of burrow underground. So like undergrounds have always kind of been in some ways um, spaces of, uh, of waiting for time to change. And I kind of quite like that sort of, because it, it reminds us of the the possibilities of temporal difference um, and what that could open up in terms of um, thinking differently about what the surface looks like. Yeah, thank, thank you for the talk. It's been so interesting. I suppose I just want to ask if you could expand on that point, really, in terms of thinking about Can you speak a bit more into the mic? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> expand a little bit on that point about uh, burrowing and waiting for time in relation to some of the things you mentioned about bunkers and who gets to have bunkers and maybe that in relation to this whole conversation mm -hmm. um, about the racialized uh, geology or undergrounds. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure I have too much to say about <laughs> yeah, the uh, <laughs> yeah, tech bros underground in. <laughs> Apart from that, would be a very good carbon storage, if you like. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think, I mean, I think kind of thinking more of a sort of poesis of the, of temporality is a kind of, um, you know, what allows us to shift our imagination to a different possibility is, is often kind of configured in those temporal moments and that kind of temporal difference. You know, and, and you know, the uh, flip side of this, which requires lots of mining, lots of underground, is like to think about something like the diamond, you know, as this something that is sustains kind of heteropatriarchy because it kind of, it outlasts, you know, it's sort of the beginning of the universe. And then it's sort of, you know, it's, you know, it's meant to last as long as a marriage is meant to last. And it's like, you know, so, so the rock is meant to be there to kind of give this sort of testimony in a sense 
to a different temporality than, you know, maybe other forms of sexuality might kind of, uh, you know, invoke in us. So it's sort of like it's there to remind you <laughs> that, like, but, you know, it requires this massive, like, moving of land, of, of um, you know, horrendous, you know, it's still, you know, the, the conditions of labor in South Africa, for example, in, in diamond mines haven't changed very much since kind of, um, you know, uh, because labor is still so cheap, and it's so cheap because of those kind of conditions of apartheid that were generated through the kind of colonial um, franchising of diamond mines by people like Rhodes. Um, so I'm always kind of like, you know, we always, that's the thing I think with geology is we look at the thing and not the kind of, and, and what are the shadow economies that kind of allow this thing to come into existence. Um, so for every kind of thing above ground that's sparkly, it's normally a great big hole and some really horrendous relationships kind of, um, but also on the inverse of that, you know, the underground has all these kind of, you know, potentialities for waiting out, you know, you just think about the kind of the underground railroad and the kind of, you know, and, and some of those, the creation of safe spaces within, you know, very violent spaces. Um, yeah, thanks very much, thanks. this has been fantastic. <clears throat> Just thinking about some of the things we discussed between Flora and myself mm. and, uh, and Mulu. Uh, what fascinated me about this, of course, that it's a national park, and it's a World Heritage mm -hmm. Site, almost completely because of the caves. It's, it's a rainforest mm -hmm. of, of great beauty, but the caves are one of the things that attract so many people. So in, in many respects, it's a great way of stopping the spread of palm oil. It's, it's a great way of protecting the forest. But it came at the expense of the Penan people, the indigenous mm -hmm. people. They were a, a nomadic people. Uh, and now they, they've had to settle. And what was their, their place of life and living, mm -hmm. uh, and they provided at all largely now been taken away uh, and they have to make a living as part of the you know sort of the capitalist tourist world mm -hmm. heritage site world and so just thinking again about what you were saying there about national parks mm -hmm. and the protection of the environment but at the expense of the indigenous people yeah yeah i mean that's yeah it's a that's a really important point. And, and national parks came into kind of, you know, they came into being as a kind of colonial artifact of preservation, which didn't include, you know, which was land appropriation. And I think it still is, you know, if you think about um, a lot of the offsetting projects and the kind of, they're about actually massive enclosure of land and expelling and eviction of indigenous people. Um, so I think, yeah, you're absolutely right, it's an ongoing, and th that's what I really like about Cave Bureau's project is because, you know, it's the sort of Maasai herders and, you know, their kind of, their take on it is just, you know, it's like the sort of, you know, petrification of the Maasai within, you know, this sort of tourist economy of a national park and, and actually that allowing that mobility through the city, through this kind of cow corridor that is shaped like the caves is a kind of way to re, you know, to think with that past and allow it to move again and allow it to kind of live again. And I, you know, that's an incredibly uh, powerful kind of regenerative um, response to, I think, that geo trauma of eviction and of kind of um, of kind of various forms of petrification. But I was glad to see your project was very collaborative. <laughs> Thank you. Hello. Um, just thinking more about the way that you present your research and the kind of actual practice, the creative practice. Uh, I was thinking about um, recording and sort of deadening the subjectivities when they enter mm -hmm. into the museum and the resistance that, that you said the geography and geology departments have. Mm -hmm. um, how can you see the need for new creative narrative methodologies? I mean, I think, yeah, absolutely, the, um, you know, 
thinking about kind of new methodologies and new, and also they, but also recognizing that those those methodologies also have been forged by lots of people in the kind of ongoing sort of indices of those struggles against kind of against kind of uh, you know deadening methods and organization and categorization cast reality of kind of subjectivity um, so yeah I think I absolutely um, and I think you know I think there's some really you know really exciting work going on at the moment that is really kind of is thinking really methodologically and and thinking kind of with those deep time methodologies that like how does the script of time actually script kind of relations and you know so how do we begin to script time differently um, and to start to kind of undermine the stability of some of those formations I think um, you know kind of people like kind of black quantum futurism for example that are kind of really doing some really kind of grounded neighborhood work but also really trying to you know, kind of attack these colonial scripts of time. And um, so, yeah, I, I mean, I think that there's a lot of creative work going on. And I think that is, that is, is just kind of, okay, so what, what does a new, like, a new kind of methodological approach to the environment look like that doesn't renew, um, you know, these kind of an extractive earth, basically? Um, I think that's the challenge. Um, is, it, is it something that, I mean, it, it's something that has to happen with alliances outside of academia, right? It's, it's not something that really works mm -hmm. as a kind of social science, humanities type methodology, is it? It's something that involves, involves a kind of, I, mm -hmm. I guess Haraway might call it some sort of sympoetic mm -hmm. kind of activity. Is that, is that how you, you see it as a... As a collaborative, yeah, I mean, and but also like a, yeah, I mean, it's it's kind of a much bigger task than all of us, right? Mm. It's like and, um, and you know, it's like we're in we're in a world that is is kind of collapsing in lots of different ways that need attention and kind of, and I think there is a there's a deficit of languages to really kind of apprehend that that don't reinforce this kind of you know various forms of kind of utopianism or kind of neoliberal good life you know that actually you know I mean I think there's a lot of work in kind of queer ecologies that's trying to grapple with those um, and there's you know a lot of work emerging now in kind of black feminists and black uh, ecologies and environmentalism that really you know I mean because the the sort of huge changes that are happening in Africa at the moment, um, in different parts of Africa, that you know is kind of massive. Um, and I think yeah, there's there's it's a much bigger collective project. Mm -hmm. I mean, it always was, and you know, and sometimes the academy isn't the best place to do those kinds of projects, right? Because mm -hmm. it's very institutionalized, and institutions are very slow. And mm -hmm. so I think you know. This is what I was kind of thinking about the inhumanities that we need a parallel institution. So there's the kind of humanities, and it's sort of it's got its discourses and its narratives and its figureheads, and and but there needs to be an inhumanities that actually puts puts the wretched of the earth at the centre of that creation of discourse, at that kind of, um, and that you know is is able to kind of move through the language of natural resources. This is a paper that you wrote a little while yeah. back, isn't it? Yeah. It's my, my frustration paper. <laughs> Hi. Um, Hi. I, I was just kind of thinking as well, or like one of the things that I've been also, um, yeah, thinking about is like how, like lithium as well, for example, is now kind of this new gold mm -hmm. that is where actually all of those mining extractivists, um, yeah, uh, things kind of like actions like still kind of continuing to happen and how if you've done any research in that as well um, since it is I think kind of like a very contemporary like yeah uh, mm -hmm. thing going on through all of the batteries that we're having 
constantly in our phones as well. And yeah. Yeah, I mean, lithium mining is obviously a big, uh, and not least because it requires lots and lots of water in places that don't have lots and lots of water. Um, I mean, when the, the sort of part of a, a new project that I'm just sort of starting is around metals. Because one of the things that um, I think, you know, there's lots of focus. I mean, in geography, for example, there's lots of focus on renewable energy and renewable kind of, and, and, and things like lithium. But also alongside those kind of rare and precious kind of uh, earth minerals, there's also just a massive increase in the use of metals. Um, and because of that sort of technological infrastructure. Um, so like we're mining much more metal than we've ever mined before. Um, and so there's like, you know, the sort of intensifications of these kind of various different forms of... Um, and so the question begins, how do we begin to join all these things up? How do we kind of begin to see that as a kind of as a world for you, as a kind of a way of apprehending the earth, and maybe how to, how do we begin to disrupt that? Um, but yeah, hugely important lithium. Um. Right, we're getting the we're getting the, <laughs> the <yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> we're getting the please please stop signal yeah. from Janan. So um, I'm sure you'd all like to uh, join me to thank Catherine again for a really stimulating, interesting talk. Thanks very much, Catherine. Thank you. Yeah.